Please subscribe, like, and share. It really helps us out. And of course, if you have any questions, comment below and we will answer you as soon as we can. Welcome to another video in our series on IGCSE Geography. In today's lesson, we will be doing a case study about volcanoes. In this case, Japan, a developed country, and the DRC, a developing country. If you haven't seen our previous videos, click on the card above. Today on our hazardous earth, Sakurajima, in Japan and Naragongo, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Both are volcanoes but in very different countries. Firstly, a volcano in a developed country. Sakurajima, in Japan. Sakurajima is a composite volcano, also called a stratovolcano, located in southern Japan. The volcano has been extremely active since the 1950s. In some years, up to 200 eruptions have taken place. Sakurajima is on a convergent plate boundary, where the Pacific plate subducts beneath the Eurasian plate. This type of plate boundary causes Sakurajima eruptions to be explosive, producing lots of ash, pyroclastic flows, volcanic bombs, and poisonous gases. The lava is andesitic, which has a high gas content, and is very viscous or thick. Japan is a developed country, with a GDP of $4.97 trillion US, in 2018. Next, a volcano in a developing country. Mount Naragongo, in the DRC. Mount Naragongo is a composite volcano located in the east of the Democratic Republic of the Congo or DRC. The volcano consists of a huge, 2 kilometers wide, crater usually filled with a lava lake, and is only 20 kilometers away from the city of Goma. Niragongo is currently, in 2020, classed as active. Niragongo is on a divergent plate boundary. The African plate is being pulled apart into the Nubian plate in the east, and the Somali plate in the west, causing lava to rise between. This results in non-explosive eruptions with basaltic lava which has a low viscosity. This is runny and fast-flowing, up to 37 miles per hour. We need to look at the impacts of volcanoes in contrasting areas. Firstly, the impacts in Japan, a developed country. The primary impacts are as follows. Around 30 kilometers cubed of ash erupts from the volcano each year, damaging crops and electricity lines. Ash needs to be regularly cleaned up to avoid disruption. Ash also causes poor visibility and can make roads unsafe for driving, which has the potential to cause traffic accidents. It also disrupts air travel. Lava flows have destroyed crop lands and hundreds of homes in the past. As seen in this picture, a 3-meter tall gate was buried by a lava flow in 1914, leaving only the very top visible. Particularly violent eruptions of Sakurajima have generated strong earthquakes. In 1914, an earthquake triggered by Sakurajima's last major eruption killed 58 people. Huge waves of energy called shock waves caused by the volcanic eruption have been known to shatter hundreds of windows up to 10 kilometers away from the volcano. Volcanic bombs which are thrown over 3 kilometers from the volcano have been known to crack windshields of cars and aircraft, causing major disruption. There are also secondary impacts. Respiratory problems caused by continual ash falls, such as asthma. There have been studies linking volcanic emissions in the area to increased cancer rates. Acid rain caused by poisonous gases emitted by the volcano has damaged crops. 40% of the land surrounding Sakurajima is volcanic soil, which is extremely fertile. This has led to a strong tea and rice industry in the area. Kagoshima, overlooked by the volcano, is the second largest tea producing region in Japan. The area has become a major tourist destination due to its national park status, the active volcano, scenery, observatories, and hot springs. The tourism industry has created jobs for locals and brought money into the area. Now, let's move on to the impacts in the DRC, a developing country. Mount Naragongo had a particularly devastating eruption in January 2002, with huge lava flows that caused major disruption to the surrounding area. The primary effects are as follows. 
12,500 homes destroyed by lava flow and earthquakes triggered by volcanic activity. Lava completely covered at least 15% of the city of Goma and destroyed around a third. Lava covered up to 80% of the airstrips at the Goma International Airport. Over 200 people were thought to be killed, many from carbon dioxide poisoning from the volcano. Carbon dioxide poisoning continues to be a threat from the volcano today. Crops and livestock were destroyed by the lava flows. Major disruption to Maine's water supplies caused by the eruption, leading to hygiene issues and drinking water shortages. 400,000 people had to be evacuated from their homes to avoid the lava flow. Let's move on to the secondary effects. Volcanic gases reacted with atmospheric gases and produced acid rain, which damaged farmland and cattle farms. There was homelessness and overcrowding in refugee camps as many could not afford to rebuild their homes. Around 120,000 people were left homeless in Goma. Cholera spread in refugee camps due to both overcrowding and poor hygiene conditions due to disrupted water. Aid organizations were also worried about the spread of measles and the conditions. Lava flows devastated businesses and destroyed shops, destroying sources of income and access to resources. Looting broke out in the city of Goma after people evacuated and left the city relatively empty. Next, let's look at the management of earthquakes in contrasting areas. Due to their contrasting levels of wealth and preparedness, Japan and the DRC have different short-term and long-term strategies to respond to volcanic hazards. Firstly, the short-term strategies in Japan. Residents surrounding Sakurajima are told to evacuate if alert levels are raised. In 2015, alert levels were raised to level 4, out of 5, and residents at particular risk were evacuated. Residents were also given evacuation cards to identify the areas that residents had evacuated to and monitor who had left the island. Special ash bags are distributed to households when there is particularly high ashfall. Residents are expected to clean up the ash in their gardens and in front of their houses. Ash can then be left in residential ash collection spots, usually next to communal waste disposal areas, to be collected and disposed of by the council. During times of high ashfall, residents usually close their windows or wear masks outdoors. Most residents are used to this as it is so common. When volcanic activity is higher, like in 2015, areas around the volcano are declared off-limits to residents and tourists to protect people from volcanic bombs or poisonous gases. There are many ports around the island made available for evacuation if this is necessary, which can be seen on the map in the green text bubbles. If people are near the volcano during a time of higher volcanic activity, for example, volcanic bombs being thrown out of the volcano, they can take cover in concrete roof shelters built around the volcano. A concrete shelter is usually always within walking distance of all major walkways. Now let's look at the short-term strategies in the DRC. An estimated 400,000 people were evacuated from the area surrounding the volcano, but the evacuation was slow and only began once plumes of smoke leaving the volcano were visible. There were also limited evacuation plans in place. Many residents had not experienced a volcanic eruption before and were not aware that lava was dangerous. Many even went towards the volcano to see, which slowed evacuation more. Because of the slow and disorganized evacuation, around 50,000 inhabitants of Goma became stuck between two lava flows. The arrival of international aid was disrupted by the damaged airport in Goma. Within a week, the United Nations had sent 260 tons of food to the affected area. Families received 26 kilograms of rations each. UK Oxfam sent 33 tons of water cleansing equipment for 50,000 people in refugee camps. The 150,000-pound package mainly contained water purification kits to provide clean water for drinking and sanitation. This stopped people from drinking contaminated water from Lake Kivu and helped to reduce the spread of cholera in some refugee camps. The World Health Organization and Medicine Sans brought year conducted emergency measles vaccinations to 28,000 children to stop the spread in refugee camps. Refugee camps were set up to temporarily house the displaced populations. This image was taken in the LTIG refugee camp, which held 7,000 people. Shelters were made out of scrap metal collected from lava flows. There was poor communication between agencies and refugees. With supplies low, 
many people began to travel back to the affected area within a matter of days to collect belongings and supplies from their homes, even though it was not yet safe to do. So, many people walked across hot lava that was not yet solidified and cooled to get home. Governments around the world gave $35 million in aid for refugees. That brings us to the long-term responses to earthquake hazards. Firstly, Japan. Annual disaster drills for residents and emergency services to practice evacuation. There is a 2km zone surrounding the volcano that is prohibited from entering as it is too dangerous. Thorough evacuation plan with multiple designated ports available for evacuation. Next, preparation. Numerous shelters have been built surrounding the volcano that is clearly signposted in case of an eruption. Large concrete channels divert lahars, mud flows form during a volcanic eruption, away from developed areas. Warning levels on a scale of 1 to 5 tell people when to evacuate. People are encouraged to have evacuation kits including hard hats to stop injuries from volcanic debris. Now, let's look at the DRC. Retraining of officials with precise evacuation plans and designated communities to target. Training of community officers who can relay information to vulnerable communities if there is an eruption. And now, the DRC's preparation. 30 new signs that detail the early warning signs and evacuation routes have been put up in areas at high risk. Evacuation drills take place in communities and schools to prepare people for another eruption. Community-level distribution of leaflets to vulnerable people containing accessible information on eruptions. The leaflets include information on evacuation routes, local shelters, and general advice detailing what to do in case of an emergency. The International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies has expressed a need for more funding so that further educational materials can be released to communities in need. Finally for today, prediction. Firstly, Japan. Volcanoes can be closely monitored to predict if an eruption is likely. Aircraft fly above Sakurajima and measure the gases it gives off. Higher levels of some gases, like sulfur dioxide, can indicate if an eruption is likely. They can also use infrared technology to see if there are any hotter areas, indicating rising magma. Seismometers measure earthquakes and tremors. Many earthquakes within a short time frame indicate an eruption is imminent. Boreholes within the volcano measure water temperature. If magma rises, it gets hotter underground and therefore heats up the water. Tilt meters can detect if there are any bulges or swellings under the surface of the volcano, indicating rising magma. Next, the DRC. Knowledge from similar volcanoes has encouraged volcanologists to measure carbon dioxide emissions from the volcano and within Lake Kivu to predict if levels will become lethal, as people can die from carbon dioxide poisoning. There is an observatory for the volcano, the Observatoire Volcanologique de Goma, which constantly monitors the volcano. The large lava lake in Mount Naragongo is visible from above, so the levels of it can be carefully monitored to see if an eruption is impending. Thank you for watching our video. Please like, subscribe and share. And comment below so we can clarify things for you.